Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you're here today, and welcome to South Columbia Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Steve. If this is your first Sunday visiting with us, a very special welcome to you, and uh, we're really glad you're here. And if you would be willing to give us a little bit of information about yourself, there should be a card on the pew back in front of you. And if you fill that out and place it in the offering box out on the table in the foyer, that would be that would be wonderful. And if there maybe there's some way we can pray for you or or minister to you. If you're joining us online this morning, welcome. We're glad that you have, are part of our worship family today. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our church. Our mission statement is to introduce people to Jesus and to help those who do know him to become like him. And we try to accomplish that through a vision of learning to worship, nurture, and outreach. And so, again, we're glad that you're here. We do not have a regularly scheduled time for taking an offering during the worship service, but there is an offering box, as I mentioned, on the table out in front, and if you would like to give, you could do that way, or you can go to our webpage and click on the tab to give, and that will give you uh, different options of how you can give. And let me just say we're very, very grateful for your support and your giving, and we thank you for that. A couple of announcements. First, I want to thank... Um, I'm not sure who everybody is in, Karen, Sue, and Dave, and uh, Cheryl, and who else uh, uh, provided for us last night an ice cream social, and uh, we, had, we had good time and great ice cream if you missed it, sorry. Uh, but there is another opportunity, and that will be in about a month, we'll be having our church picnic, and there is a table out in the foyer with some information, and if you would uh, want to go ahead and save the date and find out some more information, uh, it's out there for you. There's another table out there also that's being hosted by our Embrace Grace team. Embrace Grace is a new ministry that we'll, we will beginning we will be beginning in the fall, and it's a ministry that is targeting to unwed pregnant girls and women. And so this morning, uh, the team is focused on inviting inviting pregnant women and girls to come out to our support group and inviting you to help them feel welcome. So please stop by the Embrace Grace table in the lobby to learn more about how you can help and pick up this week's mail that is waiting for you. Let's see, is there anything else I need to announce? Can't think of anything. Um, oh, I, I, oh, JR, the, the men's breakfast. Tell me again when that is. 29th, okay, Saturday morning at at 8.30 at Bob Evans here in, in Columbia, okay. If there's any, yes, Pam, I can't see because I'm, I'm being blinded by the, all right. Okay. So, okay. All right. Every year, our church is involved in, in supplying backpacks and supplies for children. Yeah, I went into a store yesterday, and the whole wall was back to school supplies, and I thought, didn't they just get out? Um, <laughs> but anyway, all right. Well, if there's something else, we'll, we'll try to do a better job of remembering it next time. But I am glad that you're here today, and I want you to take an opportunity to say hello to someone. So would you stand and greet one another and tell them you're glad they're here today? All right, well, good morning, South Columbia. It's good to see you all here in the house of the Lord today. Please join with us as we just simply praise the Lord for his mighty power.
pray. Father, we give you praise for being the awesome creator that you are. We thank you, Lord, for the truth that your word says that your invisible attributes are demonstrated through the things that we see. And so, Lord, today what we see is a beautiful God and a purposeful God and a God of order and design, a God of power and purpose. Lord, we thank you today for uh, revealing yourself to us through nature itself. And Lord, we give you thanks today that you've chosen to reveal yourself to us through your Son. And we are grateful for the life of Jesus and for what we learn from him from the pages of Scripture. And as we continue to worship today, we pray that you would give us insight uh, into his very nature and what that means for each of us. Lord, we thank you for your love today. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son into this world that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And Father, we thank you for the joy it is to gather today and to bring our worship collectively and offer it to you, Father, as a sacrifice of praise. We ask for grace to worship this morning in spirit and in truth, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please continue to sing with us as we sing about Jesus, the Messiah who came for us.
Today's scripture reading is, is in the um, uh, book you know, of Mark, chapter 7, uh, verse 1 through 13. Book of Mark, chapter 7, verse 1 to 13. The Pharisees and uh, some of the scribes gathered to him after they came from Jerusalem, and saw so that some of his disciples were eating their bread with unholy hands that is unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the other Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thereby holding firmly to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they completely cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received as traditions to firmly hold such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and the copper pots. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk in accordance with the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with unholy hands? But he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy about your hypocrites. As it is written, the people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me, and in vain do they worship me, worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Neglecting the commandments of God, you hold on you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandments, commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and the one who speaks evil of father or mother is certainly to be put to death. But you say, If a, ma a person says to his father or his mother, Whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is given to God. You no longer allow him to do anything for his father or his mother, thereby invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for these precious words. And um, we know this passage is also a great, you know, reminder and also a warning to us. Because many times, you know, we have, you know, forsaken your laws and commandments in our life, and we recognized our behaviors, and even became a stumbling block for others. Father, we do need, you know, your your forgiveness of these wrong behaviors. 
May Holy Spirit continue to um, to convict us, you know, to remind us to be a good witness of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us once again as we continue corporate worship to sing about the great I am.
Let's take a moment and pray. Father, thank you for being who you are, that indeed you are the great I am. Lord, we worship you this morning because you are the only true God and there is none other like you. The scripture says, Father, that those who come to you must believe that you are and that you are a rewarder of them who seek you. And so, Lord, that is how we come this morning. Father, we pray that you would open up your word to us, give us understanding and insight for our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, uh, I forgot to mention that we are hosting Vacation Bible School that will be coming up August 7th through the 9th. The information in the bulletin is not correct. I just want you to know that. Uh, so we had a question about that, and thanks for bringing that to our attention. We are going to host a uh, children's fair on Sunday the 6th from 5 to 7, and uh, we're inviting children from the neighborhood and our children to come. But anyway... Uh, August 7th, 8th, and 9th from 9 till 3, we have a team who's coming to help do our vacation Bible school, so just want to uh, put that information out. If you have your Bibles, let's turn again back to Mark chapter 7. And I think it could be argued that when you come to the end of Mark chapter 6, that the Galilean ministry of Jesus is at a high point. In fact, um, his popularity with the people seemed to be at an all-time high, but beginning, um, but beginning in Mark chapter 7, that tide begins to shift. Almost immediately in the first verse we read, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem. This is the second time that Mark mentions that an envoy of religious leaders had come from Jerusalem to find Jesus. And all of the gospel writers make it clear that the greatest opposition to his ministry that Jesus experienced was from the religious leaders. I'm reminded of John's comment in the prologue of his gospel when he said he came unto his own and his own received him not. In fact, in the third chapter of Mark, after Jesus had healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, Mark wrote, the Pharisees went out and began conspiring immediately with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. And later in that same third chapter, Mark wrote that the scribes came down from Jerusalem were saying he is possessed by Beelzebul and he casts out the demons by the ruler of demons. This time, both the Pharisees and the scribes have come. Why is is that significant? Well, remember that Jerusalem was the Jewish religious hub. It's where the temple was. It's where the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court met. It was the city to which Jewish people from all over uh, the world would journey for the yearly feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that to the Jews, Jerusalem was a holy city. And the fact that a delegation of Pharisees and scribes, who are religious experts of the day, made the two-day journey from Jerusalem to come find Jesus is an indication that they're on some sort of information-gathering mission. It's not unreasonable to assume that the news about Jesus and his ministry had spread to Jerusalem and had captured the ears of the religious leaders. And so now this delegation from Jerusalem comes to see for themselves what this rabbi from Nazareth is doing and teaching. In his commentary, Hebert wrote, The entire delegation came from Jerusalem. And the use of the definite article serves to distinguish the scribes from the Pharisees as a distinct group. They, the scribes, were the official interpreters of the Mosaic law and the guardian of its sanctity. Their interpretations formed the basis for the practices of the Pharisees. These scribes had apparently been selected for their known skill in dealing with violations of the law of which Jesus was suspected. Consistent with their attitude and actions, though, their purpose was not just to gather information, but to find fault. They've teamed up against Jesus, not to search for truth, but to find grounds for accusation, and it seems that they're willing to throw anything against the wall in hopes that something will stick. Immediately, we see in verse 2, that there is a criticism about tradition. 
It says that they had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. What launches the attack that's coming here in a moment is that the religious leaders notice that some of the disciples of Jesus were eating without first washing their hands. And your initial response might be, really? They're getting on Jesus' case because of a little dirt? Uh, Are they like the teacher who observed a boy entering her classroom and his hands were dirty? And she stopped him and said, Johnny, please wash your hands. My goodness, what would you say if I came into the room with hands like that? To which Johnny smiled and said, I think I'd be too polite to mention it. Um, I read that according to the Centers of Disease Prevention, Control and Prevention, that scientific studies have shown that you need to scrub your hands for 20 seconds to remove harmful germs and chemicals from your hands. If you wash for a shorter time, you will not remove as many germs. And that kind of got me to wondering. Because I don't know what scientific studies were involved, but I really do question how that 20 seconds was determined to be the necessary time. It's kind of in the same vein as when during the pandemic we were told to be at least six feet away. Did that mean the virus could get us at five feet 11, but somehow couldn't make it that extra inch? Are germs capable of clinging to our hands for uh, 15 seconds, 10 seconds, but are genetically incapable of lasting beyond 20? Now, I I know I'm being silly and sarcastic, but I just got to tell you, I don't believe everything I necessarily read and hear. The issue for the scribes and Pharisees, though, wasn't about personal hygiene. It's about ceremonial purity. They're not germaphobes who uh, charged the disciples with eating with grimy hands, but that they had failed to wash with the proper rite of purification. And if you're a little confused, you're not alone. Because Mark took the time to explain this to his Gentile audience. Look at verse 3 and 4. It's a parenthesis. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The problem for the religious leaders was not that the disciples had dirty hands, but that they had defiled hands because they had not gone through the accepted purification ritual of washing their hands. And most Jews regarded breaking these traditions as sin. Why? Why would it be necessary to wash your hands? I mean, why would it be a sin if you didn't wash your hands before you ate? Does the Bible teach that it's necessary for you to wash your hands before you eat? Now, let me just say, it's probably a good idea from a hygiene point of view. But the simple answer is, does the Bible teach it, is no. The only direct reference I could find about hand washing was the command in the book of Exodus for the priests to wash their hands and their feet when they entered into the tabernacle. We read in Exodus, For you shall also make a labor of bronze with its base of bronze for washing, and you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet from it. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Or when they approach the altar to minister by offering up smoke, a fire sacrifice to the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet so that they will not die. And it shall be a perpetual statute for them, for Aaron and his descendants throughout all generations. This particular command had to do with the priests who were serving in the tabernacle and later in the temple. The only other command that I could find was in the laws of cleanliness in Leviticus regarding a person who had some sort of discharge who didn't wash his hands before he touched another person. But none of these references had anything to do with washing before eating. So where did this practice of ritual washing originate? Look at verse 5. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to, here it is, the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? 
Washing hands before eating was a tradition of the elders. What does that mean? I don't know what comes to mind when you hear the word tradition or traditional. You know, it's not uncommon to, buy, to drive by a church sign that that's off, say they offer both contemporary and traditional services. And I don't mean to be semantically nitpicking, but shouldn't it be something more like traditional and non-traditional or up-to-date and out-of-date? But would we really want to say that our services are out-of-date? Is that what tradition means? Let me just say that tradition is not a bad word. Sometimes in the quest to be current and relevant, anything and everything that smacks of the traditional is criticized, downplayed, ignored, or rejected altogether. But as someone observed, if you do something that has never been done before, and you do it a second and third time, you've just established a tradition. In the Rational Bible, Dennis Prager wrote, religion, and for that matter, almost anything important from patriotism to weddings needs rituals. We are physical beings living in a physical universe. Physical expression, which is what ritual is, matters. Maybe the reason we've always done it this way is because that way is right. I was reminded of the story of a, a new bridegroom who looked down at the results of his bride's first attempt of making breakfast for him. And as he sat down, he sadly said, it isn't like mom used to make. <laughs> Disappointed, she tried harder the next morning, producing a nicely cooked, attractive breakfast. But again, he looked at it and said, it just isn't like mom used to make. Well, this went on for several mornings. Beautiful breakfasts, followed by the same comment. It isn't like mom used to make. Finally, she had had enough. She couldn't take in any longer, so she deliberately fried the eggs until they were like rubber. She virtually cremated the bacon, uh, burned the toast black, made the coffee so strong you practically couldn't drink it. The husband sat down at the table and said, hey, just like mom used to make. <laughs> Tradition can provide a context for meaning and importance for our faith. Every month, we come together as a church family and observe a tradition, a ritual we call the Lord's Supper. Followers of Jesus have been participating in this expression of worship that remembered his death, burial, resurrection, and coming again for 2,000 years. The problem comes when ritual loses its meaning and we hold on to the tradition just for the sake of tradition. During a service at an old synagogue in Eastern Europe, there was a prayer that was said, and when it was said, half the congregation stood up and half the congregation remained sitting. The half that was seated started yelling at those who were standing to sit down, and the one standing yelled at those who were sitting to stand up. There was a new rabbi, and though he was uh, learned in the law, uh, uh, he couldn't find anything in the law and the commentaries and didn't know what to do. So his congregation suggested he consult a housebound 98-year-old 90, man who was one of the original founders of the synagogue. The rabbi hoped that the elderly man would be able to tell him what the actual tradition was. So he went to the nursing home with a representative from each faction of the congregation. And uh, one of the followers... Uh, the, the one of the followers who stood during the prayer asked the man, is the tradition to stand during the prayer? And the old man said, no, that is not the tradition. The one whose followers sat said, then the tradition is to sit. And the old man answered, no, that's not the tradition. And the rabbi, rabbi said to the old man, but the people fight all the time, yelling at each other about whether they should sit or stand. And the old man interrupted and said, yes, that is the tradition. <laughs> now, it is an absolute silly story, but it may be more true than we care to admit. Prager goes on to say, but if you observe religious rituals out of habit with no understanding, they can become meaningless. In other words, ethical behavior is an end in itself. Ritual behavior is a means to an end. The tradition of the elders, however, was more than just liturgy without meaning. 
It was something far more important and far more serious. The tradition of the elder were the teachings and the precepts and the principles and the customs that were not commanded in the Old Testament law, but were handed down from Jewish teachers of the law of the past whose judgments were regarded as binding and interpretations diligently passed on to others by the scribes. I, I found this explanation helpful. It says, in Judaism, there is the written law, the Torah, and the Hebrew scriptures, but there was also an oral Torah. According to the rabbinical Judaism, the oral Torah was given to Moses with the written Torah at Mount Sinai as an exposition expo exposition to the latter. The accumulated traditions of the oral law expounded by scholars in each generation from Moses onward is considered as the necessary basis for interpretation and often for the reading of the written law. Jews sometimes refer to this as the Masorah, roughly translated as tradition, though the word is often used in a narrow sense to mean traditions concerning the editing and the reading of biblical text. The resulting Jewish law and custom is called the Halakha. The Halakha is the collective body of Jewish religious laws derived from the written and oral Torah. It includes 613 commandments, subsequent Talmudic and rabbinical law, and the custom and traditions compiled in the age after Moses. Now, it's kind of a lengthy uh, definition, but the bottom line is that this traditions of the elders were laws and truths and principles that were passed down orally, but they were absolutely necessary to explain the written law. And that's really important because in essence, it is the application of the law that becomes not only equal with the written law, but more authoritative than the written law. And that's a critically important truth to understand. The traditions of men have been elevated to the status of Scripture so that a person could be guilty of violating them. So let me, let me give you, remind you of an example. We talked about this before, but God commanded his people to rest on the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And how they were to keep it holy is defined simply as not doing any work. Keeping the Sabbath holy became the problem. Not a problem of interpretation, but a problem of application. How do we keep it holy? And what constitutes work? By the time of Jesus, the religious leaders had a whole list of specific things that you could not do on the Sabbath. They actually had 39 categories with hundreds of subcategories of things that you could not do on the Sabbath. This was a part of the tradition of the elders. And to violate them in their mind was the same as violating the law itself. No wonder they're offended by Jesus, who on more than one occasion healed someone on the Sabbath and violated one of their Sabbath regulations. The same case is true in this current text. It wasn't the word of God that the disciples were violating. But the scribes and the Pharisees' man-made traditions, which, by the way, in the time of Jesus, was still an oral law. It would be written down later, but it's still this tradition passed down. The scribes and the Pharisees were legalists, and it was their law, not God's law, that they accused the disciples of not following. Jesus answers their criticism by exposing them for the hypocrites that they were. Look at verse 6. And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Jesus doesn't even address the accusation against the disciples, but as someone quipped, went immediately for the jugular. The Greek word for hypocrite, you probably know, means actor or stage player, pretender, assuming the character or identity that's different from what the person, who the person really is. Jesus quotes Isaiah 29 to reveal that they were nothing more than religious actors and pretenders who masquerade their true identity. Their, their lips do not match their lives. And so notice verse 7-8, But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. 
neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. Jesus charges them that their worship was empty, futile, and a waste of time because it was based on teaching men's precepts. You know, Jesus told the woman at Jacob's well, the Samaritan woman, that those who worship the Lord must worship with truth and spirit. But here is the exact opposite of that. Their actions demonstrate a a very stark contrast. Notice they abandon the commandment of God, but they continually hold on, which means to keep a firm grip on their traditions. It's interesting that Jesus accuses them of abandoning the commandment of God, and uh, that's the word is singular. And I can't help but wonder if he meant the great commandment, the foremost commandment, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He also, in verse 9, he says, he was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. What an ironic and perhaps sarcastic statement. The scribes were recognized as experts of the law. One explanation states not all Pharisees were scribes, but the scribes were primarily Pharisees who were interpreters and teachers of the law of Moses and the traditional rabbinical writings. Their system provided the theological framework for the Pharisees' legalistic system of work righteousness. The scribes were the dominant force in Judaism, not only theologically but socially, because their views affected every aspect of Jewish life, social and legal. And yet Jesus says, no, your real expertise is in sidestepping the law in order to keep your traditions. You know how to get around the law so you can maintain your religion of hypocrisy. I don't even know if it would be accurate to say that they were Bible plus religion because they had actually replaced God's word with their own word. Tradition had taken the place of truth. Jesus then describes exactly what he means. Look at verse, uh, down verse 10. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who puts evil of fa- speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But I say to you, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say, given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many other things such as that. You know that honoring your father and mother is one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, And the Old Testament law did teach that striking or cursing your father and mother would cost you your life. And it's interesting that honoring your parents also included the responsibility of helping them and taking care of them uh, even if they were in financial need, which could have been the case as parents aged and became older. The Pharisees, however, had created a theological loophole that allowed them to circumvent and get around any financial responsibility. They simply declared that what they would have given to their parents as Corbin, which is a Hebrew term that means a gift dedicated to God. It was a sacred vow that could not be broken. But in essence, it was a deferred gift that was pledged to the temple. One commentary explains, if a son declared that the resources needed to support his aging parents was declared Corbin, then according to scribal tradition, he was exempt from this command of God and his parents were legally excluded from any claim on him. The scribes emphasized that his vow was unalterable and held priority over family responsibilities so that they no longer let him do anything for his parents. If that's not bad enough, here's the kicker. In many cases, that gift or possession was never actually given because apparently a person wasn't always required to surrender that possession. A person could continue to enjoy, for example, the property, if it was property, until his death, at which time the remainder would then go to the temple. So such a vow allowed a person to disrespect their parents, neglect their needs, and feel good about it 
all at the same time because after all, they had done this in service to God. And Jesus' response is, you hypocrites invalidate the word of God by your tradition which you have handed down. Criticism of the scribes and the Pharisees, though, reveals a greater problem. That's the condition of the heart, beginning verse 14. And after he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are that which defile the man. And if anyone has an ear, ears to hear, let him hear. Now, Jesus' statement is connected and continues the subject of clean and unclean. But the concern here isn't about hands, it's about the heart. In context, defile means spiritually or morally, which had been the issue with the disciples not ritually washing their hands before they ate. When he says nothing outside the man, Jesus means food. And we want to be careful about straying too far from the immediate context. What he's saying is that there's nothing that you can eat that's going to morally or spiritually defile you. As Hebert puts it, Jesus spoke as a moralist, not as a physiologist. Jesus is not saying that you can ingest whatever you want to and it won't harm you. He's not saying that you can mix some cyanide, arsenic, and strychnine with your protein shake without any ill effect. Or that drinking alcohol or doing drugs can't ruin your life. Defilement is an internal problem, not an external one. And so Mark continues in verse 17. <coughs> and when he had left the crowd and entered the house, the disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, are you lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. What defiles a person morally and spiritually are not hands, but the heart. You know, in our culture, we tend to associate the heart with emotion and feeling, but in the Bible, the heart was the Control, control center of the human life. In the New Testament, it's only used figuratively as the seat of desires, and feelings, affections, passions, impulses. It's who we are in our thoughts, in our, in our, in our will, and our choices in the inner life. Dallas Willard wrote, what is in our heart matters more than anything else for who we become and what becomes of us. In his message last week, Pastor Jim warned us about making choices to follow uh, our hearts as a way of life because he reminded us of what Jeremiah wrote, and the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? When we are born into this world, we are all born with a heart condition that is affected by a disease called sin. And left untreated, the human heart can become the center for all kinds of evil. Again, from within, Jesus said, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, and adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. The day in which we live is an evil day. Uh, what's right is wrong. What's wrong is right. Truth is not absolute, and morality is relative. Instead of obeying the word of God, it's rejected with the result that it appears that every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And I don't know about you, but I sometimes feel assaulted by the rants of media and celebrities who with some kind of perceived authority loudly impose their ungodly opinions about morality and truth on anybody who will listen. It is aggravating, if not angering. But I'm reminded that the spiral away from God is always downward. 
It's true today, and it was true in Paul's day when he describes those who refuse to acknowledge God and says, and becoming futile in their speculation, now listen, and their foolish heart was darkened. Because they suppressed the truth about God and refused to honor God, the Bible says, therefore God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts and impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned them in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. And those verses, three times is the phrase, God gave them over. God gave them over to the lusts of their heart and impurity. God gave them over to degrading passions. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. You want to know how we got to where we are today? There it is. The drive for self-gratification opens up a life without boundaries, where nothing is forbidden. And if one can get away with it, why is replaced with why not? See, the heart is the problem. And the only one who can heal the heart is Jesus. In, his, in the book of Ezekiel, God promises a future restoration of his people. And he says, For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you to your own land. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all the filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you the heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so that you will be my people and I will be your God. Now it's been some time since we went through the book of Ezekiel. But what strikes me is that these promises that God makes to the nation Israel, which I believe one day will be fulfilled, is really the experience now of every believer in Jesus. God's going to make Israel clean. And yet the Bible says, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. God is going to give Israel a new heart. Yet Paul writes, the word is near to you in your mouth and in your heart, that if the word of faith which you are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now listen to this. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. God was going to put his spirit in Israel. And Paul wrote, the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the spirit he has given to us. Sometimes we might say of someone, you know, she has a really good heart or he has a really good heart. And I think we tend to mean that they're kind and caring, uh, generous. But we can only have a good heart through the renovation and rest restoration that comes through faith in Jesus. Peter wrote, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. In other words, make Jesus Lord in your heart and the very center of your being. Because the promise of God's word to us is that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, new things have come. Jesus makes it absolutely clear. It doesn't matter if our hands are washed, but it does matter if our heart is right. Now, I don't know about you, but keeping a clean heart in a filthy world 
is a daily challenge. So I thought it might be good this morning to end by just praying with the psalmist. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. Lord, truly we thank you that you do in us and for us what we cannot possibly do for ourselves. You alone are the one that can heal our heart. Lord, the scripture tells us to guard our heart. And so we pray for grace to guard our hearts so that we truly will have good hearts. Father, we pray for the empowering work of your spirit in our life every single day. And Lord, we thank you for uh, being a loving, and gracious, forgiving God. And we thank you, Father, for what you desire to do, which is to continue to change us in the image of Jesus Christ. So Lord, teach us, teach us to live with a heart that's right with you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing again one more song. And as our group comes to lead us, um, I encourage you this morning, as you think about your own walk with the Lord, and if you're here today and you've never made the decision to trust Jesus as your Savior, then as we're singing, if you'd like to talk to someone about making that decision or you want to make that decision, then slip out of your seat and meet me here at the front, and we'll find someone who will open up God's Word show you how you can make that decision to trust Jesus as your Savior. Maybe there is another commitment the Lord might be asking of you today. And if that's one that you want to share publicly, again, I encourage you to come. Perhaps for many of us today as we sing these words and we think about uh, the, uh, being together today and think about God's Word, uh, it, maybe it's just to say, Lord, I really want my heart to be right. Show me anything in my heart that's, that's not right. You know, uh, uh, or, or maybe there's some other decision. Whatever it be, uh, respond to what the Lord tells you today. If you're watching or listening online and there's a decision you want to make or some way that we can minister to you, then please uh, contact us right now. We'll respond as soon as we can. Let's stand together. you this morning for your great love for us and father i want to thank you for every person who's here and for every person who's joined us lord we're so grateful to you for what you do in our lives we are thank you thankful for this gift that you offer to us if we repent of our sin and place our faith in the finished work of jesus christ on the cross we thank you lord that you invite us to become your children and to know you and we thank you for the great privilege, uh, Lord, of being your child. And so again, Lord, we ask that you would give us grace each day to walk in obedience, to live in a way that's honoring and pleasing to you. And Father, as we leave and go out into our week, we ask for opportunities to have gospel conversations with people. 
and to be able to talk to them about Jesus. Uh, Lord, we thank you for what you can do, the difference that you make in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the power that is available to us through the presence of your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, again, I give you praise, give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning.